Hey, I'm Steph. I'm Alex. And this is Not Today. Oh, changing it up. Yes, I thought we could change it up. (laughs) I'm great. I'm very excited for the second part of the story, especially with where you left it off. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I did. I did kind of leave you on a little, a little bit of a cliffhanger there, didn't I? Yeah, I'm not mad at all. No, I'm I'm just going to start out every episode from now on just a little passive aggressively. Oh, let's not do that. Yeah, (laughs) actually, last time you were like, I'm not mad either. So. Is this, the is theme this a now. theme But I actually, I was like, come on. Oh, like from but, the way I ended it? Yeah. I mean, f- it to was, be fair. You I, said it was the middle. I did warn you that you weren't going to like it. You did say that. I did. And also, what was I supposed to do? It's a big story. Gotta, gotta stop somewhere. Gotta I know. Better make it interesting. You know what I mean? I know. I just wanted to be angry. That's all right. Well, <laughs> let's not be angry. Uh, actually, let's move our anger toward Brian David Mitchell and Wanda Barzi. Sure. And let's do that. Um, actually, I realized last week that I didn't tell you my sources at the beginning because I was just like so eager to just jump in. So I'm going to do that now. I got my information from the movie I Am Elizabeth Smart, as well as the biography documentary The Elizabeth Smart Story, parts one and two, as well as good old Wikipedia. Those are my sources. Shall we, uh, shall I jump in? Jump or? in. So... Where I left you, it was August of 2002 in Salt Lake City. And that day, the or the day in August, the police department received a call from somebody at the public library. And the caller said that Elizabeth Smart was at the library. And the thing about this was that Elizabeth talked about was when he came up to them, he never said, are you Elizabeth Smart? He, he just came up to the table and asked if they were familiar with a missing girl or, or he wanted to do an investigation about a missing girl. So that was even more scary for her because he didn't specifically say her name. So she felt like if she said anything, then there was a really good possibility that it wasn't about her or he wouldn't believe her or you know what I mean? So that was one thing that I didn't point out in the last episode. And so as the police officer walked away, she thought to herself, I should have screamed, obviously. But you know, at this point, there's nothing she could do. And right. she just had to keep on keeping on. So Yeah, I mean, yeah, to be paralyzed in fear, totally understandable. Yeah, I mean, that's a very real thing. And when they made it back to the camp, Brian told her that she wouldn't go back into Salt Lake until they left Salt Lake. And I believe that is where I left, left us for part one. So now... Wanda is left at the camp with Elizabeth again to watch her while Brian went down to Salt Lake City to do what he called, quote, ministering, which basically meant begging for money and panhandling. Ministering. Ministering. Right. He had a, he had a, a term for everything. They, they spoke in a very strange way. He'd go out every single day to beg for money and it took him about three weeks to get enough money to buy bus tickets for the three of them to go to San Diego. Because remember, it's becoming the winter months, so now they're gonna go someplace warmer. So by late August, they were just about to make their way out of Salt Lake City and to Southern California. And while they were at this camp, they ne- there was never a time that Elizabeth didn't think about when she was going to eat next or when she'd have clean water next. It would usually be a day or two that they'd go without food or water before Brian would head down into the city to look for food. And sometimes it was even longer than that. So they were constantly starving and thirsty. Sometimes he would leave and come back with just a gallon of cheap wine and a few snacks. So this was a bad time. Yeah, no Understatement. Shit. Hello, water? That feels like a really big understatement. Yeah, you need water every three days or you die. Yeah. He, this He comes back with cheap wine. Yeah. Turn the wine into water. Can you do that? Hey, Jesus. Can you reverse turn... Jesus this like this right situation? Now? Yeah. yeah. Well, unfortunately for Elizabeth, that wasn't the case. But before we totally get into what's happening with Elizabeth at the camp, 
let's talk about Richard Reese. To remind everyone, Richard Reese was the number one suspect in the police's eyes. They were completely stuck on him as the guy who did it, even though there was absolutely no evidence tying him to it. He was just someone who worked at their house. Right, yeah, he had an alibi that checked out twice, right? He had, no, I mean, his alibi, the the police thought that his alibi was a little bit suspicious, which, I mean, he did have an alibi. His girlfriend said that he was in asleep in bed with her all night, which is technically an alibi, but I understand why they'd be like, that's not necessarily the most credible alibi because your girlfriend could be lying for you, you know? True. So that's where they were at. But they were completely stuck on him as the guy who did it. And police had actually tied Reese to three other break-ins around the area. And also, I believe I mentioned in the first part, he already had a little bit of trouble with the Smart family, specifically because he had stolen things from their house. So he wasn't a great person, but he also had never really done anything like super violent. I thought you said that he robbed a place. Yeah, he's a he's a robber. He's a burglar, and like I guess he armed did robbery. Yeah, he did like I guess shoot at a cop. So and that he shot a cop. Well, I don't know that he shot a cop. He did shoot at a cop. Is there a difference? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Your Honor. No. I didn't shoot at the cop per se. <laughs> I was shooting in his direction, and I'm not violent. Right, exactly. But, you know, I just shoot people basically, from time to time. Basically, what I'm getting at is nobody would have been surprised if Reese was a suspect in a burglary, but the question was, would Reese have made the jump to kidnapping? Because that is a big difference. I don't know. In their defense, honestly, if you've already shot a cop, I don't see how that's a huge jump. No, I get it. I, I get that, that, that they wanted him to be the guy, and like they're kind of grasping at straws a little bit. True. Yeah, but they're they're totally like confirmation bias and kind of like self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, a little bit. This one. Yeah, and Reese was in prison at the time due to a parole violation, but he was the best guy that they had, so they pursued him. He wasn't in in prison at the time of Elizabeth's kidnapping, but he was, you know, in custody during this entire investigation, including the time when Brian David Mitchell attempted to kidnap Elizabeth's cousin Olivia, if we remember, just to bring it back a little bit is that right that's why they thought it was a copycat exactly like he's the guy and no one else could have done that right so they're they're stuck on him for sure and but at the same time they're receiving a huge volume of leads they received thousands of leads from the public most of them were low probability but they had hundreds of officers and investigators going out there and following up on these leads and they said that they received about 150 calls an hour which is just an enormous amount of information coming in at once and you don't really know what's what. So they were like, we are just going to stick with Richard Reese because at least it kind of makes sense a little bit. It's easy. It's easier than this, which ultimately just led to a lot of dead ends and an absolute emotional roller coaster for the family. There were multiple occasions where the family would hear someone talking about that they think they found a body or a place where Elizabeth had been decapitated, like crazy things like that. Uh, And there were lots of bodies that were found. And initially the family wanted to know every single lead, but it got to the point where it was just too much. You know, they, they were like, unless it's absolutely tied to this, do not tell me, which I I completely understand. Yeah. That's too much. It's like, you just can't deal with that. Like on top of your, your daughter being gone. Right. That's just too much. And then the media is jumping in too. Mm -hmm. It was a bad time. But on August 28th, Reese was rushed to the hospital and into surgery after having a brain a-, a brain aneurysm. The family also thought that Reese was a key factor in the investigation, but I don't know that they necessarily thought he was the guy, but they thought he knew more than he was leading on. So when he was in critical condition, everyone was freaking out because they still didn't have any direct or circumstantial evidence. So they were thinking that maybe he would be the key to something, you know, to some sort of information. And the entire time, Reese maintained that he had absolutely no involvement in the Elizabeth Smart abduction. Unfortunately, Reese did end up passing away in the hospital, which left everyone feeling just absolutely defeated. Although a lot of officers didn't think that Reese was involved with the abduction, but after he died, people were ready to kind of put the case to bed because there wasn't much else to go off of. So there was this was a definite low point in the investigation side because they were like, well, what do we even do now? Yes. I have an idea. Yeah. 
What about the second attempted kidnapping on her cousin? Maybe, maybe, maybe look into, look that, into one. that one. Yeah, exactly. And they, it's not like they were lacking for leads. It's just the leads were pretty Too much many. dead ends. So, oh, they were all dead ends. Yeah. I mean, they were, they weren't helpful. So Ugh. by October 7th, 2002, it had been four months since Elizabeth's abduction and Edward and Lois Smart were faced with the question of, do we try to move on or do we keep pushing forward and never give up? And as time kept passing, they got more and more depressed, but they did keep pushing forward because ultimately they hadn't found a body yet, which meant that there was still hope. This was, you know, just an incredibly difficult time for the family. And they did kick around the idea of, do we stop? You know, when is too much? But they were like, nope, gonna push that one aside and we're gonna keep going, which is very strong. Yeah, it's a mental marathon, really. Absolutely it is, yeah. So let's go back to Elizabeth. Around this time was when the three of them started their journey to Southern California. And Elizabeth said that the trip felt like she was deserting her last hope to be found. They got onto the bus and they sat Elizabeth by the window and Brian was next to her and Wanda was in the row in front of them. They got to Vegas by midnight where they had to switch buses. And then after that, they finally made it to San Diego really, really early the next morning. And they took the bus from from the end of the line into Lakeside. And the majority of their time in Lakeside, they were in a really swampy area. And Elizabeth said that it looked like the fire swamp from The Princess Bride. Have you ever seen The Princess Bride? You have not? No. Okay. What's your like rate of success for being like, have you seen this? And I'm like, no, it's probably Pretty like low. 20%. Pretty low. It's very low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, someone messaged me about the fact that you didn't know who John Benet Ramsey was, and they were like, "What in the name of true crime?" <laughs> and I was like, "I know." <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. At at person. <laughs> yes. Um, but anyway, after a few days in the swamp, Brian told Elizabeth that since they were in a new place, it was important for them to partake in alcohol, because that makes sense. When <laughs> when Elizabeth first started drinking, she would only drink the bare minimum that she had to, but after a while she said she drank a little more to numb herself. Um, most of the time it would just be Brian drinking and he'd drink a lot and he was constantly drunk, but Elizabeth said that there were times where it was available to her and not necessarily forced on her, but she would still partake. Elizabeth said at this time she was completely withdrawn from herself and just didn't feel because it was too hard. She completely shut down because she knew if she fought back, it was only going to be worse for her. So alcohol helped her in that, I suppose. Back at home, Mary Catherine was just continually racking her brain to figure out who had taken Elizabeth. Mary Catherine's parents had told family as well as police not to harass Mary Catherine because she was so young and also if she knew anything, she would have told them by now. And November was approaching, which was Elizabeth's 15th birthday. So it was all Mary Catherine could think about. On October 12th, Mary Catherine had her dad tuck her in as she did every night since the abduction. But that night, as Mary Catherine was thinking about who it could have been, the name Emmanuel popped into her head. She said she could hear his voice in her head, the conversation that he had with her sister that night. So she told her dad that she thought she knew who had taken Elizabeth. And so her father's like, who? And she tells him it was that man who came over and helped on the roof, the homeless person from downtown. So if we kind of rewind, if we need a little reminder here, Brian David Mitchell calls himself Emmanuel. The Smart family met Brian David Mitchell when he was on the street begging for work and they invited him into their house to do work on the house. So now out of nowhere, Mary Catherine is like, he's the guy that worked on our house. He's the guy who we gave $5 to and gave my dad's number to. So out of nowhere, it just comes to her. That's amazing. I know. And so Re Lois remembered this interaction very clearly. Like I, we said in part one, he didn't have a beard at the time and he was very clean cut. And when Lois asked him what his name was, he said Emmanuel. And I think she knew knew that that wasn't his name, but she was like, okay, if that's what you want to be called, then I'll call you that, whatever. Elizabeth's brothers said that he just seemed like a guy who had hit a rough patch and was in need of some work. 
and the next time the family saw him was when he came by their house to do work on the roof. Edward recalled that he talked a lot about being a born-again Christian and how he would go around to homeless shelters to preach. And to the family, he just seemed like a normal guy. He just worked on their house and then he left. And he was actually supposed to show up the next day for work, but he didn't show up. But since he was up on the roof working for the day, he got to see where all the windows and all the doors were. So he pretty much went to work on the house, he got what he needed, I suppose, and then he didn't come back until he did, you know? Also, I believe in part one that I said that Brian David Mitchell was most likely on their list of 60, 60 contractors, but he wasn't, which made it almost less credible to the police. Since it had been four months and all of a sudden Mary Catherine remembered the name, the police didn't really take this as the best possible lead. Apparently, she didn't say that she was positive that this was the voice that she heard. She said, quote, I think that might be the voice that I heard. So the investigator that was questioning her asked her the very pointed question of, do you want that to be the man? And her response to that was, if he's the man that took Elizabeth, then yes, I want him to be the man. This should have been the big break in the case and really turned everything around, but because of this doubt, it wasn't. They re-interviewed Mary Catherine, and now they had a composite sketch of Emmanuel. But the police did tell the family that if this Emmanuel guy was the man that took Elizabeth, they shouldn't go public with that information yet, because even if they find out it was him, it could make it a lot harder for them to find him, because he could go into hiding if he knows the, that the police are onto him. They knew that going public would definitely generate leads which could be helpful but it would also warn this person so they were like hold off until we get more information right and you've gotten nothing but junk leads to this point exactly right and I thought she had already gave like a very accurate like composite sketch to them like off the off the bat because she was awake the whole time yeah I don't think they generated a composite sketch I think they just gave like a description of him I don't think they made a sketch in the beginning but they did make a sketch now. I think the reason they didn't do a sketch in the beginning was because at first it was like, okay, I heard the voice. I didn't really see his face too well, but I, I heard his voice. I recognized it. I saw like a vague outline of what this person looked like. But now she's like, okay, I recognize the voice and I have seen this person. So let me describe him to you from the memory that I have from when he worked at the house. Oh, you understand? right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So the sketch that they made didn't include a beard. So oh, okay. I don't think she saw his face when she, mm. yeah, that makes sense. Big brain energy right there. <laughs> Just pat myself on the back. <laughs> Um, okay. But meanwhile, the family is being asked by the media if there's any new information, but they couldn't say anything. So to the media and the world, they were just like, nothing's new. We don't, we don't know, I guess. There's nothing to talk about with Elizabeth Smart. The family was just extremely frustrated because the people who were leading the investigation were still on Richard Reesey, but he was dead. So there wasn't anything to do about Richard Reesey. And they did have officers trying to find this Emanuel guy, but it wasn't the front of the investigation. Chief of Police Rick Denzi was not going to believe that it wasn't Richard Reesey until Elizabeth herself walked up and told him so. So this was, <laughs> that's what they said in, in the documentary. They're like, that he wasn't going to get off of Richard Reesey until Elizabeth herself walked up and said, it's not him. The stubbornness is overwhelming. Yes. And the police, because they believed so much that it was Richard Reesey, weren't looking for a living girl. They were looking for a body because they're like, if Reesey's dead and Reesey did it, he probably killed her and put her somewhere. So they're like, we're looking for a body, which is why the Smart family was like, can you please stop doing that? Oh my God. Yeah. So the family felt like if the police weren't going to be able to give them the answers that they wanted, they would just take it into their own hands. Oh yeah, who can blame them? This is like, this is really not a, a great rap for the police right now. No, they did not do a good job with no. this case, unfortunately. Maybe not all of them, but you know, I feel like the Salt Lake PD in general kind of shit the bed on this one a little bit. Yeah, there was a lot of dropped balls here. Yeah, for sure. Now we're going to go back to Elizabeth. They made it all the way to the San Diego foothills where they set up another camp. Elizabeth and Wanda would pick prickly pears off cacti for food because 
They were literally starving and that's all they had. And one day after harvesting what they could, they came back to camp to find Brian drunk as fuck. Wanda and Brian started fighting because of this. And you know, she was just pissed off about him being a drunk and never getting them food. And he told them that he came back early because tomorrow there would be a free Thanksgiving dinner that they could go eat. So now because of this fight, Brian has another one of these quote unquote divine proclamations that he could now have Elizabeth any time of the day. Because if we remember in part one, we talked about how he was like, to appease Wanda, he was like, okay, I'll have you during the day and I'll have her at night. But now Wanda's pissing him off. So he's like, actually, God said I could have Elizabeth whenever I want and I'm not going to have you, which is disgusting and terrible, but this is just the kind of person we're dealing with. It's it's like Elizabeth's literally just a thing. Like, it, she's not a person. So, which made Wanda absolutely pissed, obviously, because that it's her husband too, and she's like, I want him to treat me like a wife, but he's not. So everyone's angry. She, she, she was the only one who wanted to be his husband? Uh, yes, literally. Elizabeth said as soon as they got to San Diego, Brian and Wanda's relationships really started falling apart. And she said that they almost stopped pretending that it was all about God. When Elizabeth saw them falling apart, she started to feel again because this gave her hope that, you know, at some point she could use this against them and get away. And every year for Thanksgiving, Elizabeth would list everything that she was grateful for. And she did that every single night all the way through Thanksgiving. So she's really counting her blessings every single day. And she's like, I will get out of here. On December 23rd, six months after Elizabeth's abduction, John Walsh, who was the host of America's Most Wanted, broke the story on a manual and put out the composite sketch. A month prior, Ed Smart called up John Walsh and asked for advice. He told John that the Salt Lake City police believed that Richard Reese held the key to Elizabeth's whereabouts, but he's dead and he probably raped and murdered Elizabeth and buried her in the desert and that they should hold a memorial service. This is what the police had told Ed Smart. Lois was even wondering if for the good of the family, they should close the case. So Ed was basically calling John Walsh to ask if they should do that. And John told Ed that the odds were definitely against them, but he said, if you truly believe that she is still alive and you don't want to give up, then you got to keep going, but you got to give me something to help you. You know, he's like, I have America's Most Wanted. We can do something. You have to help me out. So a month later, the family decided that they would come out with the story. And that's when John Walsh was given the information that Mary Catherine believed that it was a man named Emmanuel. And they put the sketch on the show. Law enforcement still wasn't on board with the idea of giving out that information, but it didn't seem like they were doing much with it either. Now, all they could do was wait to see what kind of leads came in with this new information introduced to the public. Yeah, I was going to say, like, most of the time, you shouldn't. But in this case, it seems like they're just sitting on their hands yeah. and, like, have already just given up and move on. Exactly. Or moved on. So mm -hmm. The police hugely criticized the family for this decision, but within two weeks, they had a lead. Yeah, so how about... <laughs> what? <laughs> how about what? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to rein myself in. But I was like, how about go fuck yourself? Yeah, that's, okay. how, that's what I wanted to say. There it is. <laughs> All right. Okay. Tom Holbrook and his wife, Lisa, reached out to the police and told them that they believed that the man in the photo could have been Lisa's brother, drumroll please, Brian David Mitchell. Okay. So Edward Smart was holding a press conference about this new information. And Tom Holbrook said that he had an extremely overwhelming feeling that he needed to know what the press conference was about. And he started doing a little Google search about the story and found on the desert news that there was an article talking about the press conference and how their new lead was a man that went by Emmanuel and that they were looking for him for questioning. And Tom said he felt like he knew it was Brian. So Tom showed the article to his wife, Lisa, and she was like, do you think this is Brian? Like unprompted. She's like, is this Brian? And that's when she called the police. So she called the police on her own brother, which, you know, if, if your brother was Brian David Mitchell, I, I would too, you know? Yeah, but it's hard when it's family. Oh yeah, it's hard when it's family, but you know, he's- She a, did the right thing. She definitely did the right thing. The police soon discovered that there was an instance in an Albertsons, which I believe is a grocery store, where on August 27th, 
Brian David Mitchell was arrested for stealing $52 worth of beer, batteries, and a flashlight. They took a picture of him and asked him who he was. And at first, Brian said that his name was Emmanuel, but soon they got him to tell the officers that his real name was Brian David Mitchell. So the police take this photo and put up wanted posters in the place where he was arrested, but they were instructed to take them down and only put them up in the detective's room so that only the police could see it. And there still wasn't a lot of support for releasing this photo, both at the FBI and the Salt Lake PD. They still thought he might not be the guy because they knew how well thought out this kidnapping had to be, and they didn't believe that a guy who got caught for stealing from Albertsons would be smart enough to do this. So they're judging this arrest and they're like, he's not smart enough to take a kid, but also he's, <laughs> he's a crazy person. crazy enough. Okay, sure. You can think that, but you shouldn't not look not for the look only for lead you have. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck? Uh. I know. So back to Elizabeth. The times in California all kind of blended together because all they did was pretty much lay in camp all day long. Water was even more scarce in California because now they're living in the desert. So Brian had to get them water from the city every single time they needed it because they had no streams anymore. So they were starving and extremely thirsty. And a lot of the time, Brian was drunk. He would constantly talk about how going down into the city to quote, minister spiritually was so demanding and how blessed Elizabeth and Wanda were to be able to stay at camp together all day long. <laughs> But he left them literally starving every single time. And now we've reached day 152 of Elizabeth's captivity. And on this day, they were all sitting in their tent doing whatever when they heard a voice of a man approaching the tent. He was calling out, is anybody there? Because he saw this tent, which first of all, I don't know why as a hiker, you'd see a tent and be like, hello? Like what? <laughs> What are you gaining? Like, do you want to know who's in that tent? Like, why? Usually I'd agree with you, but like, in this case, shh. No, okay. I <laughs> no, I get it. Like, yeah. obviously I want no, Elizabeth I... to be rescued, but like, in the mind of the, the hiker who knew nothing about this case or what was going on, why would you go up to a tent in the middle of the foothills and be like, hey, who's there? What's happening? <laughs> like, no, no, no. Yeah. Anyway, I wouldn't have done it. No, me neither. I mean, I'm a woman, but like, Jesus, that's crazy. Anyway, so when they heard this, Brian immediately jumped into action and he is, he grabbed his knife and was ready to jump out of the tent and literally kill this man because crazy people are potentially living in a tent in the desert. Maybe don't approach it. I don't know. Uh, but Elizabeth said she knew that if she yelled, Brian 100% would have killed the man and then killed her. So for the sake of not being the reason this man died, she didn't say anything. And she said that that doesn't make her weak. It makes her strong, which I agree. Amen. But go. like, yeah, she like he would have died, but yeah. it's also for her. Exactly. Yeah. After that, Brian absolutely freaked out and said, now heathens have entered their camp. And because of their failings, meaning Wanda and Elizabeth, they needed to pack up and move again because it's Wanda and Elizabeth's fault that a man randomly stumbled upon the camp. That makes perfect right. sense. Uh, logic is his strong suit. We can all tell. Clearly. Andy has three first names. Did you notice that? It's <laughs> <laughs> really like, funny. People with two first names are sus, but like Brian, three? David, and Mitchell, pick yeah. one. You don't get all three. You don't get Stop them. Stop it. Exactly. So now they moved up into the San Diego mountains, which meant now they really wouldn't be having anyone stumble upon their camp, but it also meant that they were even further from civilization and resources. Yeah, what fucking month are we in? We're in like December, January. It's still probably like 60, 70 degrees. Yeah, I mean, it's not cold. It's not, it's fine. It's the desert. We're good. Except at night. On day 184, Wanda and Brian had another huge argument because they loved doing that. And Wanda accused Brian of being a sinner of lust. Brian said that she was wrath and envy and greed, uh, which then led to Wanda picking up Brian's knife and threatening to kill herself. Brian got up slowly and walked toward Wanda, telling her to calm down until he basically tackled her and got the knife away. That's when Wanda got up and left the camp screaming. 
And when she came back, she said that she heard from God and he told her that her election in heaven is now assured and it doesn't matter what she does from now on, meaning she no longer has to follow Brian. She also told him that he is no longer following in God's footsteps and he has strayed from the path. To this, Brian got up and said that he was going to town and he didn't know when he'd be back. Okay, wait. She said she has secured the election in heaven. Yeah. God told her, you're good. You're getting into heaven. (laughs) We have a seat Mm -hmm. in Congress heaven for you. And it's for you. And it's for you. It doesn't matter what you do ever again. (laughs) That's what he said to her. Exactly. So that's what's happening right now. And when he left that day... Wanda and Elizabeth only had enough food and water at camp for two days. So that's not good. And an entire week went by. After three days of starving, Elizabeth said she and Wanda could hardly sit up. They were so weak. And she remembered that in the hole where they kept their feces, someone had thrown a grapefruit peel. And she thought maybe that it would be okay to go get it and eat it. But it wasn't okay and she didn't end up eating it. But that's where they were at. She thought to herself, after all of this, she was going to die of starvation and thirst and how just shitty that was. After about five days, Elizabeth begged Wanda to go get water. She said she wouldn't run because she physically couldn't. All they did was sit in the heat with no food or water for like seven days. And Elizabeth said she laid there dying, literally, and thought about how she wanted to see her family one last time, but she didn't want to die angry and bitter. So she just thought about the time before she was kidnapped and came to the conclusion that she was happy for the time that she had with them at all. On night number five, Elizabeth and Wanda woke up to the sound of rain. They both got up and started celebrating with whatever energy they had left and set up buckets and tarps to collect water and were able to drink the rainwater. Amen. She <laughs> No, like this is like <laughs> a sign from God Lord. literally. The election was won, here's your water. Yeah. She said even with the rainwater when it started to look like things had started growing on it a couple of days later, it she was just so grateful that they had it. So that's literally saved their lives. And what do you know? Finally, fucking Brian rolls back into the camp and he's singing a song as he comes back into camp. He brought back some leftover KFC and he sat down at the camp and just started talking to them while Elizabeth and Wanda were so weak that they literally couldn't sit up because of how hungry and thirsty they were. He told them that he had gone into Lakeside and stolen some beers and drank them. And then he broke into a church. And the next morning, the police came and they arrested him. And he gave them a fake name and they told they told him that it would be a week before the judge could see him. So, you know, he's in jail for like the week that they're starving and dying of thirst. And when he did finally see the judge, somehow he talked his way out of it. And he told the judge that this was the first night that he had ever been drunk. And he was so sorry and it wouldn't ever happen again. And the judge, I mean, thankfully, let him go. Okay, I don't know how to feel about this one. That's so stupid. I know. You didn't even get his real identity, and then you believed a sob story. Mm Mm-hmm. But this saved her life? But it saved her life, so that's good. Wow. He told them this whole experience reminded him who he was and who they were. He had this saying that they needed to descend below this before you can rise above it, which basically meant you had to experience the worst of life before you can, you know, rise above it and be, like, godly i guess or whatever go to heaven whatever the fuck this whatever the fuck it means i'm not going to try to understand but he basically told elizabeth that she needed to experience you know alcohol and being raped and starving so that one day she could rise above it and go to heaven i guess so he literally told her this he's like you know i needed to experience this because i needed to descend below you know to the sinners blah blah blah. He's bitch a- what did you descend to he's a crazy person I know, but this is another level of just stupidity. Yeah, yeah. We're just crazy. Just crazy. Um, But now he was back, and at least they had food and water, you know? Yeah. So in February, the police were still thinking that Brian David Mitchell wasn't their guy. 
even though they were working with Lisa Holbrook, who was Brian's sister, but Mick Fennerty, who was the chief FBI investigator, decided that if the police weren't going to go public with this information about Brian David Mitchell, then he was. So he gave all the information to America's Most Wanted, and they were given his full name, all the photos they had of him, and that he was the only person that Mary Catherine said that she remembered. And because of America's Most Wanted putting out this information, Brian's ex-wife, Debbie Mitchell, saw his photo on TV and called in. She was almost hyperventilating as she called in and told them that he goes by the name Emmanuel and he's a street preacher and is a con artist. She told them that he had a psycho wife named Wanda Barzi, and she also told them that while she was married to him, he molested her daughter. So she's like, he's not an idiot who got arrested for, you know, just stealing some beer. I mean, he is, but he's also a fucking evil person who is a con artist and a manipulator and he's everything evil, you know? So finally, there's like yeah. some proof. So that's when the entire case finally started to explode. Wanda's children also came forward and said they believed that Brian David Mitchell could have done something like this. They called him Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It was just a flood of information about both Brian and Wanda, which was great because this is exactly what we wanted. You know, they were like, don't put out the information, but it's like, if you, are you, what? <laughs> you better put out the information, otherwise we're not gonna get shit. And they did and they got shit, so here we are. They had heard rumors that Brian David Mitchell would regular a spot called Super Salads. Uh, it's a restaurant, I believe. So Elizabeth's uncle, her uncle Tom, went to all three of the locations in the area and he talked to the manager at the Fort Union Boulevard location and was told that he does come in to Super Salad and the last time he was there, there was three of them, David and Wanda and a young girl. And Elizabeth's Uncle Tom literally fell to his knees when he heard this information because he was like, oh my God, Elizabeth is alive and I can tell my family that. So he immediately went to Edward and Lois's house and said, I think that Elizabeth is alive. And her parents were like, yeah, I think so too. But now they had like kind of some proof. Right. Very exciting. Finally something. Yes. Let's go back to Elizabeth. So this craziness in San Diego mountains continued for a long time. And now we're going to skip forward to around early March of 2003 nearly nine months after Elizabeth's abduction. They are all just laying in the camp when Brian gets up and tells them that he has an announcement. He says that the Lord has declared that it's time for them to move on from California. He tells them that he's thinking that they should go back to the East Coast and not Salt Lake. He talked about possibly New York or Boston, and he said that this move was going to be really big, which means that it would be permanent. Elizabeth hears this and her mind is reeling. That's when she stands up and she tells Brian that she's been overwhelmed with the feeling that God wants them to go back to Salt Lake. She tells him that the Lord told him that he'd be blessed with more wives there and since their path has been blocked in California, maybe it's a sign that they should go back to Salt Lake City. She tells him, I have this feeling that it'll be harder for you back east. And she's like, you know, God didn't speak to me, but I just have this overwhelming feeling. And I, she's like, do you think you can ask the Lord if this is right? And she's like, you are his prophet. I just know he'll answer you. Elizabeth had spent months learning to talk to them and listening to this like completely made up crazy religion, but it's been nine months of her listening to this and she knows how to play the part. No, I, I'm like impressed because it's like she is basically acting. No, she is. To a T. 100%. Yeah. yeah. She, she is 100% playing the role that they expected her to play at some point. They were just waiting for her to be converted to this, you know, to subscribe to their craziness and she finally had in their eyes. He basically tells her that he'll pray on it, but it'll take more time to gather money in California than it did in Salt Lake City. So Elizabeth comes up with the idea that they should hitchhike back. She says, I know you two have hitchhiked in the past and since Ed and Lois, meaning her parents, had sheltered me too much, I need to experience hitchhiking to bring me lower, meaning, you know, closer to God. Okay, so now she's playing into this descending lower thing. And she's like, I know I need to descend lower. And, and I really think that this is an experience that I need to have. And that way he wouldn't have to spend days scrounging for money and 
they wouldn't have to stay at the camp. So when Wanda hears that they wouldn't have to stay at the camp anymore, if they hitchhike, she immediately gets on board. She's like, yes, she needs the experience and you'll no longer have to deal with the heathens in California. So wa- immediately Wanda's on board. Oh my God. Yeah. Have they ever agreed on anything I mean, they, for this past nine months? Like literally no. But, but Wanda's like, I don't have to sit in this camp. Yeah, get me the fuck out. Yeah, she's like, amazing. She does need to descend lower and hitchhiking would do just that. So they're, they're so excited. So Brian agrees and says they'll have to find a different face covering for Elizabeth because now they're not going to wear the veils. Okay. He is also extremely impressed with Elizabeth and says that the Lord is finally begin- beginning to work with her, which makes him extremely happy. So he trusts her a little bit, which is huge. She had learned to use his own tricks against him and got him to take her back to Utah. Can we get a moment? Round of applause. Amen. (laughs) That's your favorite word. You love amen. Is it not fit in like most situations? No, it does. It's just, it's just funny. It's also, I guess it's a little weird for this story because it's like really religious. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Um, Anyway, their solution to no more face coverings was getting Elizabeth a wig from the dollar store as well as a pair of sunglasses from the dollar store. And this wig was like a curly gray afro, almost like old lady hair kind of thing, and just a pair of sunglasses. So that's what Elizabeth is rolling up in. (laughs) It's like a Halloween costume. Yes, it is, 100%. So the following morning they left. It was extremely difficult for them to get rides. Even without the robes, they still looked strange and out of place. And they would just have to walk for miles and they'd be so hungry and so thirsty to the point where Elizabeth even thought to herself, maybe this wasn't a good idea. The last stretch of the way, they were luckily able to take buses back into Utah. And on the bus, there was a young man who started to question Brian about Elizabeth. He was asking why she was wearing a wig and saying she's obviously a young girl and she wouldn't have gray hair. So like, what's the deal? kind of thing, you know? And Brian didn't like that at all. So as soon as the bus stopped, he had all of them get off in Sandy, Utah. And right as they got off the bus, they were walking up State Street and the police received a call that someone had spotted Brian David Mitchell walking with two women. But remember, Brian hadn't seen any of these wanted posters or anything because he'd been up in the mountains. So he didn't know that he was on America's Most Wanted and, you know, he shouldn't just be wearing a wig. And, you know, he wasn't wearing a wig, but you get what I'm saying. But so as they were walking, a bunch of police cars pulled up on them and pretty much just swarmed. And when they asked Brian David Mitchell for his name... He told them his name was Peter Marshall. He also told the police that they had given up all of their earthly possessions and they were messengers of the Lord Jesus Christ, so they didn't have any identification. Can somebody smack him? I hope somebody in prison smacked Brian David Mitchell. I'm sure. I hope they, do they tackle him and like maybe just like give like one good smack into the back of his head while he's down? That would be a good addition to the story, but I don't have that in my notes, unfortunately. Damn it. Yeah. One of the policemen said that he recognized the young girl as possibly being Elizabeth Smart and tried asking her some questions, but Elizabeth was extremely nervous and still wasn't saying anything to this point. Brian was still trying to get the police away from her by saying that this is my daughter and you can't talk to her. And the police said that her heart was beating so fast and so hard that you could literally see it through her shirt. That's how scared she was. It was not good. Elizabeth had been so isolated and manipulated and controlled for so long that this was a terrifying situation for her. Finally, one of the op- the officers separated her a little bit from the group to try to ask her some questions. She started telling the officers the things that she was told to say, like she was raised in Florida with her mother and had only joined her father and her stepmother this past year. So she's surrounded by police asking if this is Elizabeth Smart. And she's like, I am, I'm, uh, I, my dad is here and my mom is in Florida and blah, blah, blah. Like she's completely brainwashed. But her story wasn't adding up to the police officer and he said, I don't believe you. And the officer had someone fetch a missing persons flyer of Elizabeth out of his car and he held up the poster next to her face and said, that's you. And she said, that's not me. Oh my God. Of course she wanted to be rescued, 
but she spent the last nine months being mentally, emotionally, and sexually abused every single day. So she denied that she was Elizabeth Smart for about 45 minutes. Wow. At that point, she felt extremely threatened and had been brainwashed and her captors were still standing right there. So she did not feel safe. She was still terrified that if she told the police her name, that they wouldn't believe her and she would be sent back with them and they would kill her and her family. So the officers handcuffed her and they all took them separately into different cars and you know, they're gonna transport them to the station. And in Elizabeth's mind, because she was handcuffed, she believed that she was in trouble. And as she was sitting in the back of the cop car, the police officer said, okay, this is your last chance to tell us on your own free will who you are. And he said, are you Elizabeth Smart? They could tell she was getting really emotional, but she finally answered, thou sayeth. For the last nine months, they didn't speak with you and yours. It was thee, thy, and thou. That's how they spoke because that was, you know, the old timey religious speak that they had at camp. So Elizabeth figured if Brian was still not that far away and if he heard her answering this question with that kind of response, he might not know what she was responding to. So it was the only way she felt safe answering that question. But the two officers in the car looked at each other and they were like, okay, we'll take that as a yes. So finally. Hey, hey. <laughs> Finally. Amen. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. right. Uh, so on the way to the police station, all she could do was ask the officer what was going to happen to them because she was worried that they would put her with them again and she might be hurt or even killed. She still felt like nobody was on her side, even though all of these police were trying to save her. Wanda, Brian, and Elizabeth were all in different rooms to be interrogated and Elizabeth was able to give investigators a detailed description of her abduction and captivity so Brian and Wanda weren't going anywhere. Finally. Amazing, finally. As Elizabeth was sitting in the room, the door burst open and it was her dad. She said that she didn't really move because she didn't know how to react since so much had changed. And it wasn't until he ran over to her on the sofa and hugged her that she felt like it was safe for her to react and hug him back. You good? Yeah. Get a little verklempt over there? <laughs> As we've been on, like, the roller coaster, they had the news writing that, like, somebody in their family abducted her. You're right. They're getting all these false leads that they can't know if it's true. Is she dead? The police force has been telling them that they're, she's dead for months on end. They're not doing anything. Have to go to America's Most yeah. Wanted to get any traction. Yeah, I know. You're right. And You're right. After nine months... No, you no. finally hug your daughter for the first time? No, I, I agree. I, it's a very emotional um, moment. I'm, I, I'm sorry for poking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to it. Um, two agents interrogated Brian David Mitchell, and he told them how he was a servant to Jesus Christ, and he was the prophet as he does. And as soon as they'd get close to details of Brian admitting that he broke into the smart house and took Elizabeth against her will, he would kind of just retreat back and get quiet and defensive before reverting to his religious mode and kind of just talking in circles. And Jeff Ross, who was an FBI agent, spent about eight years working in a mental hospital in Ohio. And during that time, he had seen a lot of people who had pretended to be crazy. So that was the impression that Brian David Mitchell was giving him, that it was all just kind of a big show. The only admission that he had ever given them was that he plundered Ed Smart. That's all he said. What does that mean? That's what he said when he was going to steal Elizabeth's cousin was, you know, I'm going to plunder Olivia, like I'm gonna steal her. So I guess it's just another way of him saying I stole from Ed Smart, meaning his daughter. But he didn't actually give like a full confession. Okay. Yeah. Elizabeth said that she hadn't really felt fully safe until she was finally home with her mother and her father and her siblings. They had balloons everywhere and the entire family got to come over and hug Elizabeth and see that she was actually home. She also called John Walsh from America's Most Wanted to thank him herself, which was actually really meaningful to him because he felt like they finally got somebody back to their family. Because, I mean, think about it. It's America's Most Wanted. You're just talking about the people who are murdered and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. He was like, that was an amazing moment. Yeah, not usually a happy 
endeavor. No. But she said that she felt like a princess. She went from that morning being with her captors to now being back home with her entire family. And the night that she got home, she went to, you know, go upstairs and go to bed. And her parents kind of looked at her and were like, are you sure you want to do that? Like, we can all have a big sleepover in our room tonight with everyone. Like, we can just have a big, big sleepover. Um, But Elizabeth said, no, I'm going to sleep in my bed. And don't worry, because I'll be here in the morning. (laughs) Which seems like a very movie thing to say. Yeah, I know. If it was anyone other than her, I would have been like, too soon. But (laughs) (laughs) It was literally her, so it's not too soon. Yeah, no, I guess, I mean, how could you know? But like, I just, I feel like I wouldn't, I would definitely have gone for the sleepover option, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah, but think about it. Like, she just spent nine months sleeping with people. Yeah, on the ground, like, not by herself. Like, I'm sure she just wanted some time by herself, which I get, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So she did that's that. another thing that like I guess you wouldn't think about is like literally having no privacy at all whatsoever during that entire time no. and like always being with other people. Well, yeah. I mean, she didn't even have control over her own body. I know. Like it's more than just no privacy. Like she didn't even I get it. Yeah. I'm just saying that's oh, not no, something I, know. I thought about. No, exactly. I mean, you don't think about that she's literally with someone 100% of the time for 9 months. And, like, a lot of the time, she was shackled, you know? I mean, not for the second half of it, but for the first half, insanely strong. Like, I I can't even put into words how strong she was and is. And, you know, after she got home, they got plenty of offers from therapists. Some people were saying that she needed to be hospitalized and taken away from society and worked with before she could return to normal life. But it was really important for the family to allow Elizabeth to make her own choices because she had just spent nine months with absolutely no control over what happened to her. And her parents knew that they had to honor her wishes. And she chose not to be hospitalized or even speak to someone professionally for a while. I mean, I think at some point she did end up talking to therapists, but it wasn't at that time. Yeah, she said her parents became her therapists if she ever needed to talk to someone. But that being said, Elizabeth did say that she does believe in therapy and that it can do a lot of good for people, but she also said that it was extremely fortunate for her to have such a supportive family. Believe it or not, it took eight years from the time that Elizabeth was rescued to the time that her case actually went to court. Eight years? Yes. What the fuck were they doing? It took this long because Brian knew that if he rambled long enough, he might be deemed insane and unfit to stand trial. They would constantly evaluate him and were fighting over whether or not he could stand trial. And in 2004, the court did deem him competent enough to stand trial. And at first he agreed to plead guilty to kidnap and burglary, but he wanted them to drop the sexual assault charges in exchange for a 10 to 15 year sentence on the condition that Elizabeth would not testify against him. So he's asking for a lot in that. Yeah, just, no. Yeah, the no prosecution. No deal, Howie. Exactly. Like, we're done. Exactly. Close the box. No deal. The prosecution stayed strong and didn't agree to that. Yeah, I mean, I think they have a pretty like open Solid and shut case. case. Yeah. yeah, exactly. In court, Brian would try to act as crazy as possible and make a scene because he wanted people to think that he was insane, which worked because in 2005, his lawyer filed a statement saying that he was no longer competent enough to stand trial. Um, But it was all an act. He would act crazy in court and then he would go back to jail where his guards would say that he would be completely fine and normal. But the judge ruled that he had psychosis and was sent to a mental hospital until 2008. That was like what he was going to have. But in 2006, a bill was passed that allowed prosecutors in Utah to apply for the defendants to be forcibly medicated to be competent enough to stand trial. They ended up doing this for Wanda and she pled guilty and was only sentenced to 10 years in prison. I mean, I'm not happy, but it just seems like every single, like, not every single case, but, like, most of them, it's like, I don't know. That's, like, not enough time. No. (laughs) What were her charges, do you know? I mean, it was kidnapping, sexual assault, like, it was all of them that Brian got. She definitely should have been charged with a lot more or not charged, sentenced to a much longer term. It's insane how little she got. Um, and it was because that she took a plea deal. Mm. Did that, did that sentence even make sense? It was that 
what did I say? It doesn't matter. It was matter. because she took a plea yeah, deal. No. Yeah, no. Point being, it was because she took a plea, a plea deal and she got a lower sentence for doing that. Still sucks. Doesn't, doesn't feel great. Ironically, they didn't end up medicating Brian for whatever reason um, to continue his case. So it just continued to be stalled. I mean, you get the picture. Ultimately, it was found that Brian Mitchell had some wild, irrational ideas that seemed like delusions, but were not the product of mental illness, but more cocky, arrogant, narcissistic individual with a lot of religious language. So he was deemed competent to stand trial, ultimately, thankfully. And Elizabeth actually faced him in court and wasn't having any of his bullshit. She told the court that he was an evil man who was incredibly smart and manipulative and didn't actually care about religion. He was just self-serving and it was all an act. So she was like, don't even focus on this asshole. He is a piece of shit in so many words. She was an excellent witness and was able to help the jury see through his charade. And in May of 2011, he was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. That's a sentence that I can agree with. (laughs) We can get behind that one. That one's good. Wanda Barzi was actually released from prison on September 19th, 2018. Elizabeth spoke out about this uh, and as it was happening to express that she felt that Barzi was still a threat and should remain in prison, but she was still released and active, actually lives about 600 yards from an elementary school. Trying to wrap my head around yeah, that Yeah, you one. have no words. I'm just watching you trying to like figure out what words you're feeling right now. So she wasn't even put like on the sex offenders list? I think she was, but... Or I think... But she, there wasn't anything in her parole saying that she couldn't live 600 feet, or not feet, yards from an elementary school. Well, um, I mean, I guess, like, if she's going to do it, 600, more than 600 yards isn't going to stop her. Right. But it still is, like, really? Yeah, the community's pissed. I mean, they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, this Yeah, it's like, disturbing. we're going to keep an eye on this bitch for the entire time that she's here. Yeah. Barzi also voluntarily agreed to not go to any geographic locations that the Smart family might frequent. Her Williams, her attorney, said violating any of these conditions could result in her return to prison, although Williams was not able to say for how long, adding that it would depend on which condition had been violated. Oof, I can't even imagine yeah. seeing her in public after that. Yeah. Elizabeth responded to this uh, by saying that she is taking precautions to protect her family, but refuses to live in fear. She said, I lived in absolute fear and terror for nine months. No matter the outcome, I will not do so again. So that's, that's good. She's, I mean, she's just (laughs) incredibly strong. I don't even know how else to put it. Like not every person could, could do what she did. Yeah. To, to face him in court and then have that attitude. Yeah, but even though that was kind of the most recent thing that happened with this case, I wanted to put that, you know, not as the last thing that we talked about because I kind of wanted to end on like a a good thing, you know? So let's go back to Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth was able to continue living her life after being rescued and really thrived. She finished high school and college and had many friends and some boyfriends along the way. And on a missionary trip to Paris, she met Matthew Gilmore, who was from Scotland, and the two of them started dating and got married and now have three beautiful children. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Today, Elizabeth Smart is an American child safety activist and commentator for ABC News focusing on missing persons. She has done a lot of work as an activist and advocate for missing persons. And here are just a couple of incredible things that Elizabeth have done, has done. On March 8th, 2006, Elizabeth went before the United States Congress to support sexual predator legislation and the Amber Alert system. On July 26, 2006, she spoke after the signing of the Adam Walsh Act, which uh, organizes sex offenders into three tiers according to the criminal the crime committed and mandates that tier three offenders, the most serious tier, update their whereabouts every three months with lifetime registration requirements. So that's a really good thing. In May 2008, she traveled to Washington, D.C., where she helped present a book, You Are Not Alone, published by the U.S. Department of Justice. It contained entries from her as well as four other recovered young adults. 
Um, she has spoken at a number of conferences, and on May 1st of 2013, she talked about normalizing sexuality in women and rejected the idea that the value in women is based off of their virginity or sexual history, which I think is an incredibly important thing. In February of 2014, Elizabeth also testified before Utah State House of Representatives in favor of HB 286, the bill would create an optional curriculum for use in Utah schools to provide training on child sexual abuse prevention. And the list really goes on. She really has done so much. She has done so many speeches. She has written two books that I'm going to tell you the names of in a little bit. But like, damn, you know? Yeah, like she she just works. She really made her life surrounded upon, like around, you know, helping people who have dealt with similar things to her. And she's like, you know what? I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. And I'm going to pass that along to as many people as I can. Yeah. And I can't like think about how, how, how many people that she's probably saved, like just from the Amber Alerts alone. I know. Just to get that like yeah extra few hours to, to search for somebody or just get more people aware of it. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Yeah. And actually in 2019, while traveling home to Utah aboard a flight... Elizabeth was woken up by the passenger next to her who had begun rubbing her inner thigh. She reported the incident and began a self-defense program for women called Smart Defense. Wait, what happened on the plane? She was pretty much sexually harassed on a flight in 2019. The, The man next to her woke her up by rubbing her inner thigh. And her response to this was to begin a self defense program called Smart Defense. That's wow yeah like what um that's amazing elizabeth said she is in a really good place in her life now and she is happy and like i mentioned earlier she has written two books about her experience one in 2013 called my story and the other in 2018 called where there's hope healing moving forward and never giving up um there's also been a number of movies and documentaries made about her experience that you can watch if you're interested and If you'd like to look into the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, oh, because she also, did I mention the Elizabeth Smart Foundation? You did not. She has a, she started a foundation, the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, that is dedicated to, you know, all the things that she does. Fights for. (laughs) Fights for, for. like, you know, child abuse and sex trafficking and survivors and all that stuff. And you can donate if you so choose. If you are interested in looking into that, I will link it in the description of this episode um, and possibly donate. That is the story of Elizabeth Smart. Yeah, I can see why it was so highly requested. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge case. She is a force to be reckoned with. um, Mm -hmm. And I I can't say enough good things about her. Yeah, I mean I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. I feel like I've said it all. And yeah, <laughs> I mean I, we've we've talked about the whole story. I mean this was an emotional roller coaster. It sure was. It really was from start to finish for everyone involved. So that's that on that. Um, do you have a good thing? Oh, um, one of my favorite comedians is going to be in town when I go back to Michigan. Mm-hmm. So I'll actually get to see them on tour. Hell yeah. So I, I um, love that. I'm excited video. about that. That's great. My good thing is that I got my phone back. I am so happy that I have a phone again. Uh, although <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse because I feel like when I didn't have my phone, I got more work done. But, but you weren't able to watch TikTok. That's true. It's a very important part of my day. I have to. Yeah, I mean it it sucks because I've I lost like a couple years worth of pictures, which is pretty devastating. Um, but I got my phone back and I have some pictures and I am excited to make new memories. Let's make it a positive, there you go. shall we? Um, yeah, I don't know. Goddamn. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this two-part uh, story. If you'd like to follow us on Instagram and check out all the pictures that we post about each of the stories, follow us on Instagram at nottoday underscore podcast. If you have a suggestion or a story of your own that you'd like to send us, send it to our email at nottodaypodcast at gmail.com. We have a TikTok that is nottodaypodcast, a Twitter that is nottodaypodcast, but the T on the end of podcast is a three. Because that makes sense. Because that makes sense. And just keep breathing. Yeah. Yeah.